the afternoon session. I'm very happy that there's still, still some people here interested in what we're going to hear now. And I'd like to introduce Mark A. Lewis, who's going to give the first lecture. He's assistant professor of European history at the College of State in Ireland in New York. He researches the history of international criminal law, the history of political policing in Central and Eastern Europe, and comparative genocide. He's currently researching political policing in Austria and Serbia during World War I. He received various grants, and his publications include the story of Holocaust survivor Jacob Frank, who was Himmler's Jewish tailor. In 2008, Mark Lewis published an article on the World Jewish Congress and the Institute of Jewish Affairs in Yad Vashem Studies. And today, he's going to read a paper on the World Jewish Congress archives in the Holocaust area. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the many institutions and individuals who helped bring me here, specifically the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute, Dr. Lapin Eppel, Dr. Roski, Greta Anderl, Dieter Hecht, and also the support of the Rothschild Foundation. I sincerely thank you for helping me come here today. In 1983, the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati, Ohio, obtained the papers of the New York headquarters of the World Jewish Congress, an international network of diaspora activists and intellectuals who tried to protect Jews before, during, and after the Holocaust. The transfer of papers to Cincinnati was beneficial because it preserved Holocaust-era records and made them more available to researchers. Yet it did not reopen the question of whether diaspora Jewish organizations, including those in the free world, had done enough to rescue Jews in the 1930s and during the Holocaust. Nor has it led to a critical independent history of the World Jewish Congress. Today, I will offer a brief history of the World Jewish Congress, or WJC, during the Holocaust era, explain the history of how the American Jewish archives acquired the Congress's uh, headquarters papers, and discuss how the archives have been used. Then I would like to propose that historians could write a history of the organization with new questions and new methods, delving into the internal dynamics of the organization and the role of female leaders. It is also possible to write an intellectual history of the Institute of Jewish Affairs, the WJC's research division, to determine its influence on the non-Jewish world. Finally, the records could be used to create a social history of restitution seekers. First, the history of the WJC. Founded in Geneva in 1936, the World Jewish Congress was a political lobbying organization whose original mission was to protect the political, economic, and religious rights of Jews in the diaspora. It concentrated mainly on Germany, Poland, Hungary, and Romania in the 1930s countries with the strongest radical right-wing movements and whose governments implemented anti-Jewish legislation, taking Germany's law for the restoration of the professional civil service in 1933 and the Nuremberg laws of 1935 as their models. The WJC's founders, including Rabbi Stephen Wise, Nahum Goldman, Nora Baru, and Kate Knufmacher, were Zionists from continental Europe, Britain, and the US. They opposed wealthier, established Jewish organizations whom they viewed as conservative, undemocratic, and assimilationist. The group was the direct descendant of the Comité des Délégations Juives, the Committee of Jewish Delegations, which was a Geneva-based organization which lobbied for the minorities treaties after World War I. Prior to 1938, the WJC's main accomplishments were leading the economic boycott of Germany, taking legal action against Germany in the League of Nations to prevent the Nazis from implementing anti-Jewish legislation in Upper Silesia until 1937, and 
conducting political negotiations to give German Jews in the Saarland a one-year period to emigrate with their property before the Nazis implemented anti-Jewish legislation that already applied to the rest of Germany. 1938 revealed a progressively worsening situation showing the limits of lobbying governments. The WJC pressure on the Goga Kuza government in Romania did not lead to a rollback of all the government's anti-Jewish decrees. In Poland, the WJC backed demonstrations in Warsaw to protest anti-Jewish economic decrees, while the colonel's regime accused the WJC of trying to destroy the Polish state because it published a book exposing flaws in Poland's economy. In Germany and Austria, the WJC could do little in the wake of Kristallnacht, particularly for the 30,000 Jews sent to concentration camps. During the 1930s through 1941, the organization carefully tracked the, quote, Kold Pogrom, which was the name that the Institute of Jewish Affairs, the WJC's research department, gave to the period when Nazi Germany and the Axis satellites used legislation and administrative decrees to strip Jewish communities of their property and pauperize them. Already in 1940 and 41, the Institute contended that legal discrimination had been a premeditated step toward ghettoization in 1939 and 1940, and that the low caloric content of ghetto rations was intended to starve Jews. From 1939 to 1941, the WJC ran a tracing service for missing persons in occupied Poland and in the Soviet Union, and organized deliveries of food and medicine, despite the Allied blockade and restrictions on financial transfers to Axis and occupied countries. In August 1942, Gerhard Riegner, the WJC's delegate in Switzerland, obtain reliable information that the Nazis had formulated a plan to deport three and a half to four million European Jews to concentration camps in the East and exterminate them with prussic acid. Riegner notified US diplomats and then telegraphed the information to WJC leaders in London and New York. During the fall of 1942, the organization received information about many other aspects of the final solution the deportation of the residents of the Warsaw Ghetto and their murder by gas, the use of gas vans at Chelmno, and the operation of a dedicated extermination center with crematoria at Auschwitz. Therefore, the WJC was an important link in the chain of notifying the Allied governments about the extermination plan in progress. The bigger issue, though, is what the organization could do about it. The attitude of the Allies is well known. Emigration restrictions for economic, political, and supposed security reasons. The WJC lobbied to loosen visa restrictions and also organized some concrete rescue plans. In 1943, Riegner and Mark Jarblum spent 18 million French francs to help approximately 3,000 French Jewish children, youth, and parents reach Spain and Switzerland. They also procured fake documents to hide 4,000 to 5,000 Jewish adults in France. However, as the overall death tolls mounted, the mood inside the WJC was mixed. Riegner always sought bolder, more comprehensive rescue plans. The director of the Institute, the Lithuanian international lawyer, Jacob Robinson, formulated new legal concepts for war crimes trials but he reported in 1943 that post-war Jewry would face an unprecedented catastrophe because Jews had been rendered propertyless. They had been, uh, many of the young people had lost years of schooling and countries which had never had Jewish communities were now accepting immigrants but lacked support networks for them. Arya Tartakover, the WJC's director of relief operations and Kurt Grossman of the political department stated that Jews returning to their European homes would face continued anti-Semitism, while Jews colonizing Palestine would likely clash with Arabs already there. Nehemiah Robinson, another international lawyer in the Institute, recognized in 1944 that Jewish organizations needed a plan to recover airless property and claim Jewish reparations after the war. Ultimately, 
In the later phase of the war and in the first post-war years, the WJC found some political solutions. Riegner's lobbying catalyzed the US government in January 1944 to create the War Refugee Board, which, fac which facilitated the transfer of money and supplies to concentration camp prisoners. Robinson and his colleagues in the Institute had a decisive influence on the US prosecution's case at the first Nuremberg trial. Tartikover and Grossman's idea of an international agency with the authority to deal with all aspects of the refugee problems influenced the post-war creation of the United Nations Refugee Agency. Nehemiah Robinson's idea for an agency that would receive restitution payments from airless assets shaped the later formation of the World Jewish Restitution Organization. And Noah Baru opened negotiating channels with the Bundesrepublik in the late 1940s to discuss reparations payments to both Israel and a non-governmental organization representing diaspora Jewry. The archives. The WJC kept records of its work for internal use, not with the intention of creating a public archive. The organization had offices in New York, Geneva, London, Stockholm, and Buenos Aires. The first headquarters were in Paris, which were moved to Geneva at the start of the war, and then were moved to New York after the Nazis had conquered France. At that point, the WJC also opened a London section to stay in contact with exile governments. Each office kept its own records, which is why there are now different collections of papers in different archives. The papers from the New York headquarters have been housed at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati, Ohio since 1983. These contain papers from the WJC's predecessor, the Comité des Délégations Juives, the records of the WJC's preparatory conferences in the 1930s, and all the papers of the WJC's main departments, including those involved in political negotiations and rescue and relief. This is an enormous collection, almost 148 meters in length, and filed into 1,221 boxes. In his book, Discipline and Punish, Michel Foucault asserts that military academies, schools, hospitals, and orphanages created archives in the 18th century as a means of disciplining individuals and creating hierarchical categories used to judge them and force them to become normal, erasing their individuality. He criticizes the archive, claiming that it invented the case study as a technology of control. The papers of the WJC, created in the 20th century, certainly reflect the processes and records of a bureaucratic organization, but they were not created to form case studies about individuals or control them. While there are files on individuals who sought restitution after the war, and legal analysis requires fitting special cases into the constraints of categories, the goal was to help people. Furthermore, the WJC kept its correspondence, field reports, and research analyses for active policy work, the organization of rescue and relief, and legal advocacy to shape peace treaties and international legal frameworks. Writing a history of the WJC did not have to wait for the point when AJA archivists obtained the materials in the 1980s and created the first finding aid for them, which they didn't do until 1989. Members of the WJC at different points wrote histories of the organization themselves. They did this to legitimize it, to prove its continuing value, and to engage in self-criticism. Later, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, academic historians such as David Wyman and Monty Noam Penkover investigated the central question of whether Jewish organizations in the free world had uh, done enough and done everything possible to save Jews. Both scholars used papers from the WJC stored in London and I believe also stored in the Central Zionist Archive, and they interviewed members of the organization but they reached opposite conclusions. Wyman maintained that US Jewish organizations had not presented any concrete rescue plans to the Roosevelt administration in late 1942 and had been diverted from real action by calling for a Jewish commonwealth in Palestine as their main goal in 1943. Penkover, examining the question from an international perspective, argued that government apathy 
and latent anti-Semitism were the serious obstacles, although there were some successful rescue operations. The preservation and organization of the papers saved the headquarters files from disintegration and opened up many new vistas for research. Prior to 1983, the WJC stored the headquarters files in a Manhattan warehouse which did not have heat or air conditioning. The packing cartons holding the papers were falling apart. The story of how the papers came to Cincinnati in 1983 is partly good luck, but also pluck on the part of the American Jewish archives. By the early 1980s, the WJC was burdened by storage costs and sought a home for the papers. The AJA's administrative director, I mean the American Jewish Archives administrative director, uh, the historian Abraham J. Peck, recognized the paper's value and negotiated access terms with Gerhard Riegner and with Elizabeth Epler, who was then, I believe, the assistant director of the Institute for Jewish Affairs in London. Alfred Gottschalk, the president of Hebrew Union College, which houses the American Jewish Archives, organized funds to move the papers. Cataloging and sorting the archive was a major project because this was the largest collection the American Jewish Archives had ever acquired at this time. Therefore, the AJA has to be credited for preserving these important materials and creating excellent working conditions for researchers as well as fellowship programs that allow them to come to Cincinnati. Perhaps it is not strange that the papers have been moved so many times, from Paris to Geneva to New York to Cincinnati, since so many leaders and intellectuals who themselves were emigrants or stateless refugees joined the WJC. On the other hand, the goal of the American Jewish archives is to document American Jewish life and culture. Yet only a portion of the WJC's activities concerned the U.S. government and Jewish organizations in the U.S. It was an organization of networks, and many key WJC actors were located in neutral countries and in occupied countries during the Holocaust. For Abraham Peck, the organization's history is not an American story, but the story of Jewish organizations in the free world and their interventions to save Jewry. His important two-volume collection of WJC documents, published in 1990 as part of the Archives of the Holocaust series, continued raising the question about whether the WJC had done enough to save Jews. Furthermore, he did not shy away from the WJC's controversial refusal to recognize Jewish organizations in post-war Germany. For Eine Remus, the historical consultant who worked on the second stage processing of the collection, the papers, quote, will not revise history, unquote, but show that the WJC was more proactive in rescue efforts than previous scholars believed. The current AJA director, Gary P. Zola, recognized in 1999 that the collection was valuable for restitution research after a researcher from the US Presidential Commission on Holocaust Assets used the papers. This came at the end of a decade when the WJC and class action lawyers representing Holocaust survivors negotiated with Swiss banks to pay for dormant accounts and also for slave labor profits that passed through the Swiss banking system during World War II. Zola, who is devoted to making the archive available to the public, helped obtain a grant from the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati to hire more archivists to create an, uh, a more detailed finding aid, one which went down to the folder level. Additionally, the AJA microfilmed the papers with the help of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and then started scanning them from, from 2002 to 2004. It shares a portion of the digital collection with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, which also has copies of other WJC collections from London, Geneva, and Stockholm. And I believe from conversations with Rochelle that these come from the Central Zionist Archive. New possibilities for research. There is a clear need for a critical independent history of the WJC from the 1930s through the 1950s and perhaps later. However, the archives only go through 1982 and do not include internal discussions about the Waldheim affair or the WJC's negotiations in the 1990s with Swiss banks to permit an independent audit of wartime accounts. <clears throat> 
Researchers inside the WJC and academic historians have examined different sides of the organization, ranging from rescue and relief to war crimes prosecution. A new critical history could include the important question of whether the organization did enough to rescue Jews, but it could also ask new questions and employ new methods, rather than diplomatic history based on 19th century positivist methods. One could study the organization's internal bureaucracy to understand the national dynamics of the French, Polish, Lithuanian, British, German, Austrian, and American Jews in key WJC positions. The archives could be used to trace the organization's interpretation of the diaspora concept. A critical history could also determine whether the WJC actually took positions on rescue in 1943 that alienated the International Committee of the Red Cross and why the WJC had better luck with Red Cross delegates in Eastern Europe. And this is something that's shown from the Red Cross record side in Jean-Claude Favet's excellent study. There is also a need for an intellectual history of the WJC's research division, the Institute of Jewish Affairs, comprised of refugee scholars and demographers from Lithuania, Germany, France, and Poland, and Austria. The Institute's emphasis on Jewish economy and legal affairs was different from the Frankfurt School's concentration on capitalism and political power. While the latter was probably far more influential in the wider intellectual world, one would like to know whether the Institute's ideas influenced non-Jewish thought in any way. In some ways, the Institute's causal explanations of Nazism were derivative. Robinson adopted Franz Neumann's explanation that the Nazis instrumentalized anti-Semitism as a way to unify the German nation over class divisions. Yet, the Institute proposed shrewd interpretations about other matters. Its sophisticated analysis of the minorities treaties showed multiple sides of the issue. Municipal courts had no power to determine whether local laws conformed to the treaties, while in the League of Nations, there were five times as many fair rulings as unfair ones. The Institute also showed with empirical evidence that the rations provided to Jews in Nazi-controlled Europe were much lower than other populations and were designed to starve them to death. This was meant to explain to the non-Jewish world that Nazi ghettoization was an exterminatory measure. Furthermore, the Institute in 1945 prepared a major legal brief that influenced the Nuremberg indictment and the U.S. prosecution's case at the first Nuremberg trial. The Institute summarized much of what occurred in Nazi Germany and Axis-ruled Europe and created an intentionalist explanation that identified a series of progressive stages. These started with legal exclusion and ended with physical destruction. No legal organization at this time, Jewish or non-Jewish, had established, in my view, such an extensive, well-documented historical and legal interpretation of the, of the destruction of European Jewry. The role of women in the WJC has been overlooked and should be restored. One cannot assume that the concerns and needs of women during the Holocaust were the same as men, nor can one assume that many women who served as secretaries to the WJC headquarters were simply passive paper pushers. I suspect that several probably weighed in when major decisions were made. Others played important roles in different diplomatic and relief efforts. Kate Knuffmacher, a Berliner, co-founded the WJC and also worked in Central America during the first part of the war. Ellen Hilb ran a division devoted to establishing Jewish orphanages in Europe in 1945-1946. Lady Eva Redding, the president of the WJC's British section, lobbied Churchill not to intern Jewish refugees from Holland as enemy agents. Elizabeth Epler, who was a member of the Hungarian Jewish Council in 1944 when it was forced to implement Adolf Eichmann's instructions, became the assistant director of the Institute of Jewish Affairs some decades later and produced one of the first studies about the WJC's rescue efforts. Additionally, I have read passing references to women's sections in the Congress movement, but have not found any study of them during the Holocaust era. Separate from the history of the WJC, the papers could be used to create a social history of restitution claimants whose cases from 1948 to 1963 are filed in the archive. 
The researcher could categorize these by nationality, age, type of loss, type of inquiries made prior to contacting the WJC, and reasons why cases were delayed, denied, or successful. One could create a social profile of victims and their relatives, synthesizing experiences during the war with those after the war. This might reveal a different perspective on survivor experiences than that described by Lawrence Langer in his work about individual memory in video testimonies. While Langer presented many insights about the nature of survivor narratives and the overly positive values that listeners place on them, he did see survivors as atomized individuals. He did not deal with their financial claims, economic rebuilding, or ways they attempted to deal with Jewish and non-Jewish communities in a, a broad collective sense after the war. To conclude, the WJC Archives is the American Jewish Archives most heavily used collection, as many scholars find pieces of the collection useful to study individual areas of the globe where the Holocaust occurred or where refugees sought entrance. Yet there is an opportunity to reopen the important question of whether the WJC's rescue efforts were simply pinned down by the Allies' blockade and by government apathy, or whether there were internal and financial problems that hindered it as well. There is a major opening to write a critical history of the organization from its founding through at least 1948, discussing the formation of the diaspora concept, how this was altered by the destruction of the Jews in Europe, and the creation of a Jewish state in 1948. An intellectual history of the Institute, concentrating on whether its studies had much impact on other intellectual schools and the non-Jewish public might give us a counterweight to the more famous Frankfurt School. Finally, studies of women involved in WJC rescue and relief would help transform the old scholarship which erased the role of women. A social history of restitution seekers could build on a new direction of scholarship that seeks to understand how claimants from the bottom up interpreted the Holocaust and asserted moral and legal claims for others' responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk and for posing some further research questions and topics. Our next speaker is Attila Guido, who is a historian and a research fellow at the Romanian Institute for Research on National Minorities. This is a public entity under the authority of the Romanian government and aims at the intent multidisciplinary study and research of the preservation, development, and expression of ethnic identity. Um, Odila Guido studied history and Jewish history in Romania. His publications include the Transylvanian Jews in Romania from 1918 to 1940, and the surviving Jewish inhabitants of Clui, Care, and Oradea. I don't know how to pronounce it right. In his paper on Transylvanian Jews, which is also published online, he deals with the history of Transylvanian Jews as a history of integration and he discusses the functions of identities and loyalties. It also focuses on modern anti-Semitism, Holocaust, identity problems with the Zionism. Attila Guido is going to talk about the 1946 survey of the World Jewish Congress among the Romanian Holocaust survivors. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. The Romanian section of the World Jewish Congress conducted a national survey among the Jewish survivors of the Holocaust in 1946. The objective of the survey was to assess the human and material losses and uh, record the grievances suffered by the surviving Jewish population. In addition to this, the statistical data gathered was intended to serve as a basis during the negotiations of the peace conference ending World War II and for compensation claim. Hereafter, I will analyze this survey and its few results regarding three towns from northern Transylvania, Cluj, Kare, and Oradea in their Hungarian names Kolozsvár, Nagy Károly, and Nagyvárad, uh, which belonged to Hungary during the Holocaust. In the autumn of uh, 
1944, the Soviet and Romanian troops took over the control over northern Transylvania. Thus, after a few months of Soviet military administration, the territory became part of Romania. The Romanian section of the World Jewish Congress was re-established on 19th November 1944 and extended its activity to northern Transylvania as well. The organization had multiple objectives as they outlined it in a publication uh, from 1945. Studies and documentation about the Romanian Jewry, economic and social activities, work related to refugees and deported persons, legal and political activity. So the main activities of the World Jewish Congress after World War II included conducting surveys among the Jewish population, which resulted in two statistical summaries published in 1945 and 1946. 1947, sorry. This survey uh, was carried out not only on territories belonging to Romania uh, during the Holocaust, but in northern and southern Transylvania as well. Bilingual questionaries in Hungarian and Romanian uh, were printed for the Jewish survivors for, from the territories which belonged to Hungary between 1940 and 1944 in accordance with the mother tongue language competence and cultural background of the Jewry from northern and southern Transylvania. Uh, monolingual questionaries were used in uh, uh, other regions of Romania. A completion guide uh, in Hungarian and Romanian and a letter from the Romanian section of the World Jewish Congress were enclosed with the questionaries. The letter formulated in Romanian referred to the objective and the importance of the survey and also to the fact that the results were important for the peace conference from Paris. Inquiring about uh, the survivors and victims, the 20-page long questionnaires consisted of 10 questions and several subsections. Not only the head of the family, but also the other family members had to complete personalized questionnaires, thus many data overlapped. The respondents were required to provide personal data as name, age, place of birth, residence, marital status, education, and occupation. So uh, uh, they were required to provide personal data information about their citizenship and describe the anti-Semitic uh, discrimination and the grievances they suffered during the deportations. They also were asked to give details about their expropriated properties and material losses and provide information about their life conditions and incomes before the deportation began. A separate set of questions referred to the forced labor service, ghettoization, and deportations. The respondents were asked to give the names of their family members and acquaintances who died, but also those of their surviving relatives. At the end of the questionnaires, space was left blank for respondents wanting to describe in detail the horrors they experienced. The World Jewish Congress only partially processed the questionnaires completed in northern Transylvania, similarly to the data gathered in other regions in, of Romania. There has not uh, been written any in-depth analysis based on the material, which makes the remaining questionnaires all the more valuable. After the completion, uh, completion of the survey, the fate of the questionnaires remained, remained unknown. We only know that during the communist uh, years, the original material was kept in, a, in the basement of a Jewish newspaper with its headquarters in Bucharest. Uh, the water infiltrating in the basement destroyed a large amount of the questionnaires. Presently, the, the archives of the Romanian Jewish Historic Center keeps the remaining material, although a significant part, uh, of, uh, a part is in unusable con uh, uh, condition. The questionnaires which uh, can be used for research provide only partial information for each Romanian settlement, and only a fraction of the questionnaires have been found 
with regard to the three towns from northern Transylvania, which are in the focus of uh, the, my presentation. Thus, uh, my analysis is based on uh, 418 questionnaires in total. The persons completing these questionnaires reported additional 112 survivors and almost 2,000 family members and acquaintances who died. In my study, I focus ex exclusively on data concerning the survivors. In spite of uh, its fragmentary character, the material remains a very valuable source for the research of the social history of the Holocaust. Even if the results do not allow us to produce general statistical data on the losses, social stratification and demographic features of the Transylvanian Jewry after 1945, they enable us to present tendencies and individual life paths. Uh, um, questionnaires are valuable sources also because they offer an early and complex assessment of the damages. In addition to recording data, they also allowed the survivors to tell their stories of suffering. Many respondents made use of the opportunity to recount and write down their grievances. The World Jewish Congress con conducted similar surveys not only in uh, Romania, but also in other countries from the region. In Hungary, uh, some 165,000 uh, Jews were recorded, and in the course of the survey carried out, uh, in the course of the survey carried out uh, between 1945 and 1946. Two similar surveys were carried out in Bucharest in uh, 1945, where the personal narratives of some uh, 800 uh, Hungarian Jews were recorded, and in Budapest, where according to, to common criteria, the National Committee for Attending Deportees uh, in Hungarian uh, Dagob uh, recorded the personal stories of uh, some uh, 5,000 uh, uh, Holocaust survivors. In both cases, the testimonies were recorded in minutes and not uh, written down uh, by the survivors. So, uh, using the World Jewish Congress's customary's data, I created an SPSS database. This is a, a program uh, used mostly by, by sociologists. Uh, so I created an SPSS database with the most important data of the survivors and of the victims declared in the questionnaires. I published the result, results of my investigation under the form of a study in November uh, 2010. So uh, you can see here uh, the, uh, the data uh, of the survivors. Uh, there are a lot of columns uh, with uh, different data, uh, place of birth, date of their birth, their occupation, uh, their gender, uh, a lot of quotes. I, I don't want to... Uh, uh, the place where they were ghettoized, the data when they were uh, deported, the first... Uh, uh, deportation station, and so on. Okay. Uh, as I have already mentioned, the Vojish Congress questionnaires inquires also about the following personal data. Name, age, place of birth, residence, gender, measure, status, education, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, in the following, uh, we will deal only with the age and gender of the survivors. According to the literature, mainly the persons of middle generation survived the Holocaust. In the case of our three cities, the respondents and the persons they reported were from the age groups which had more chances to survive by avoiding the, the gas chamber. Uh, 
uh, I mean the age groups uh, uh, between uh, uh, 16 and 35 years and 36 and uh, eight, uh, 48 years. On the basis of uh, all the completed questionnaires, we can conclude that the uh, respondents fell into the following age groups. Um, 58.9% were well between uh, 16 and 35 years, and 28.5% uh, were well between 36 and uh, 48 years old. As the table below shows, 87% uh, of the survivors were in these two age groups. In uh, this distribution of the age groups can be considered as characteristic for the Hungarian Jews of the entire region. According to the similar survey carried out between 1945 and 1946 by the Hungarian section of the Wojcic Congress, the survivors in the territories attached to Hungary after 1938 had almost the same age distribution. The overrepresentation of the young and middle-aged caused many problems among the survivors after the war. There was hardly any family that did not have a member who died in the Holocaust. In most cases, even the partners or couples lost uh, one of the members. Therefore, it is important to analyze the gender distribution of the respondents from the point of view of restarting and rebuilding of the individual lives. In all three, in all three towns, uh, men represented approximately two-thirds, while women constituted only one-third of the survivors. Comparing the gender distribution with the distribution by age group, we, we find that men represented the majority in all age groups. The overrepresentation of men may be due to the fact that a significant part of the able-bodied men were drafted into forced labor during the Holocaust. Although the forced labor service did not guarantee homecoming, it provided changes of survival much higher than the deportation. We can also see that the majority of the survivors below uh, 15 years old and over 61 years were men. Among them, only five uh, 15 years old were liberated from the concentration camps. Uh, the rest of the survivors from the two age groups escaped the Holocaust by running away, hiding, or resid residing in Budapest. The World Jewish Congress questionnaire started with asking personal information, uh, personal information, followed by the list of persons reported by the respondent. Uh, as either survivors or uh, victims. Most of the questions referred to the anti-Semitic system and to the Holocaust. In this section, I will analyze the answers given to the survivors' fates during the deportations. The questionnaires confirm the fact that Auschwitz-Birkenau had been uh, the first station for the majority of the Northern Transylvanian Jewry. 80% of the respondents had been deported first to Auschwitz-Birkenau, 6.7% to Mauthausen, and other persons to other concentration camps. A part of the deportees remained in Auschwitz uh, after the selection, while the others were dispersed to various camps across the Third Reich in order to work in plants which were important um, for both the German economy and the military industry. On the basis of the uh, Wojcic Congress questionnaires, I attempted to survey the fate of the survivors. We may observe that most of the homecoming Jews had been deported to the Nazi camps, while 27.5% uh, had been forced laborers. Uh, relatively few of the survivors uh, survived the war by hiding, either in the country or in the Budapest ghetto. Even fewer survived in hospitals, prisons, or by fleeing to Romania. According to the literature, the Northern Transylvanian survivors started arriving home 
after spring 1945, when the main Nazi camps had been liberated. Our findings confirm this. Only persons who were hiding, escaping, or imprisoned, uh, or uh, the exempted Jews had been staying in northern Transylvania until the region was liberated in October 1945. The forced laborers started coming home in October 1944, uh, by January, 17% uh, of the survivors returned to the three towns. Most of them were men, as the proportion of women increased uh, after the liberation of the concentration camps. So the number of homecoming survivors slightly decreased during February, April 1945. The gender balance was increasingly restored. Uh, the decrease may be due to the fact that the large number of forced laborers serving on the eastern front lines had returned by that date. One could also expect the return of the forced laborers driven or deported to West and of those captured by the Russians. The number of returnees from the concentration camps increased around uh, May 1945 as the rest of the camps were being liberated in April. Almost half of the survivors arrived home, either of the three uh, towns between May and September 1945. A part of them came home with the, with the trains circulating on the routes uh, Oradia Krakow and uh, Cluj Prague during March June, while some survivors traveled, in, traveled individually. As the table below shows, the proportion of, the, of uh, returning survivors started to decrease from autumn 1945. Uh, and a few words about the health uh, condition of the survivors. Very few examinations have been carried out on the health conditions of the returnees after the war, and it be, uh, therefore we have uh, little data in this regard. The World Jewish Congress questionnaire inquired about the health status and damages of the returnees. Uh, more than half from the total number uh, of respondents answered this question by declaring multiple injuries. However, in many cases, instead of listing their actual health problems, the respondents only stated being ill and completely weakened when they arrived home. Less than one-fifth of the survivors declared that they had uh, been in a satisfactory or good condition at the moment of liberation. The declared health damages included arthralgia and rheumatism, heart diseases, typhus, frostbitten limbs, and neurosis, and so on. Overall, 17.2% uh, of the respondents stated that they arrived home in acceptable health conditions, while 82.8% uh, of the Holocaust survivors suffered various health problems. In conclusion, uh, the Jews from Transylvania surviving the Holocaust faced several problems and challenges after 1945, uh, like demographic issues, uh, I mean the almost uh, full absence of children and elderly and the imbalance of the genders, health and social issues, many persons suffering serious or permanent health problems, uh, and a high proportion of those having precarious subsistence. Uh, they faced uh, 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 other uh, problems were vocational retaining, uh, reclaiming the confiscated properties and valuables, and the reintegration within the Romanian society. They also needed to deal with the traumas caused by Holocaust and with problems related to their national identity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions or com please? 
Um, thank you very much for these very interesting papers. Um, I have two questions for Attila, but I wonder um, whether Mark possibly could comment as well from his possibly broader perspective. Um, the first question is, well, I'm very interested in to the phenomenon of the questioner uh, in its own right. And I, I guess more colleagues are, uh, because it's an important instrument uh, by this time. Um, we had um, in last year, the Euro European Holocaust Research Infrastructure organized a workshop about early documentation of the Holocaust. And while this was not intended, it seemed like the questionnaire uh, that the historical committees were using after the war in Poland, Hungary, um, uh, elsewhere, or the set of questions um, 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 were, that, that was of a, quite an interest to us. To what degree this um, is just a set of questions, to what degree this is actually related to you. Uh, the YIVO um, research practices, to what degree this uh, links back to the Chicago School, etc., etc. So I wonder if you could comment on this, and specifically because you've shown Romanian uh, World Jewish Congress uh, questionnaires and Hungarian, do you just uh, try to comment whether these were identical, if there's um, uh, the same kind of methodology behind them, etc., etc. Um, and possibly if you can say something about similar sets of questionnaires for other countries that would be, uh, that the World Jewish Congress was using, that would be very interesting. Um, the second question is, um, you have analyzed the questionnaires in quite some detail and developed your own analysis, but I wonder how this source was analyzed by the time in 1946, 47 uh, and beyond. So, uh, my my English is not the best, but I try to <laughs> answer you. Uh, so uh, I know only the Hungarian and Romanian questionnaires. I don't know if, if there are in any other countries the uh, same questionnaires. Uh, the questions are mostly the, the same in the Hungarian and, and in the Romanian questionnaires, but I didn't know anything about the methodology. Uh, uh, I didn't find anything uh, about this. Uh, we don't really know how was uh, uh, this uh, uh, survey organized by, uh, by the World Jewish Congress, if, if it was organized uh, with the help of the local Jewish communities, parish communities, or not, or, or, or with the help of, of, the, of other Jewish uh, uh, organizations. Uh, so, uh, I cannot uh, tell anything about the methodology. I, I, I see that the question, questions are, are mostly the same, but why, why are these questions included the question is and how it was included, I, I don't know. Um, what was the second? The, uh, um, so the World Jewish Congress uh, published two, uh, two publications on, on, on the Romanian uh, Jews, on the Romanian survivors in 1945 and 1947 but they published only uh, general data, and, and uh, they didn't publish anything uh, from, from these questionnaires. They, they published uh, data which were known uh, before uh, 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 this uh, survey. Uh, the, the number of uh, Jewish population before and after the war, the, the year social structure, and so on. I don't think I have much more to add. Um, it's possible that there could be information in the archives of the Institute of Jewish Affairs about the construction. However, I'm not sure, Attila, if uh, was it Romanian scholars who were affiliated with the Congress who were actually conducting the study? And that, if so, that would mean the records might not be in uh, the main headquarters collection. So I don't think I have an answer. I have a question for each of you uh, from um, Mark Lewis. Um, in 
the mid-80s, when the AJC papers went to the archives in Cincinnati, we were seeking to create a list, an authoritative list of DP camps, and we wrote to HIAS, we wrote to the Joint, we wrote to the uh, archives in Cincinnati and to the United Nations. And because the papers had not been processed at all, they could not send us anything. And I wonder if that information has been included in the processing and the finding aids and in the um, access points. And my question for you is you mentioned that there were narrative accounts, but they were not written by the survivors themselves. Did I understand that correctly? In the surveys? No, uh, they were written by the survivors. They were, and there are narrative accounts written by the survivors, not just the answers to the surveys. A, a, a narrative account? Uh, I don't Yeah, uh, uh, at the end of the question is there was a blank space where they uh, wrote down their, that, but not, the, uh, there are f very few uh, persons who uh, written down, uh, wrote down their uh, sufferings. All right, I was just curious, and if, if it was written by them or somebody else, and if you had read any of them, and how revelatory they were. I didn't hear. How, didn't hear. how much information they provided. Oh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> the question about the finding aid, it goes down to the folder level, and I suspect that they, the lists have been processed, and the information is there. All the finding aids are available through the AJA website after I could show you specifically where to go to help you narrow in on which department and where they might be. But I think that it would be possible now to create that list of DP camps. And it's also something that Abraham J. Peck was personally very interested in because he studied post-war German and Jewish relations, and he himself was born in a DP camp, so it's something that I'm sure interested him greatly. I suspect that by now it's been done by the, the second round processing that they finished uh, in 99. Yeah. Uh, I have sort of a question and sort of a comment. Um, more for Mark, and this is not a criticism uh, in any way, it's just to maybe open uh, a possibility of discussion of a point that you raised, which is that the uh, archives uh, might shed light on the question of whether the World Jewish Congress had done enough to save the Jews. And to my mind, it, it shows that um, part of, of the problem of using archives is framing the questions one asks of the archive. Because I feel that the very question of whether the WJC could have done enough or whether this uh, Jewish group could have done enough, uh, or it comes back a little bit to blaming the victim which is precisely what happened uh, uh, in the post-war period concerning the conduct of the leaders of the, uh, of, of, of the ghettos. When in reality, we should blame the Germans. When in reality, we should blame the Soviets for constructing a defense that was completely indefensible, when in reality we should blame the Americans for not accepting Jews uh, when it was possible uh, to do so. And uh, I, I, just, I just feel that this question uh, again reflects, and I'd, I'd love to hear your response to this, but again it reflects a kind of a perennial Jewish proclivity toward self-condemnation for one's own victimization, uh, which uh, 
I, I think uh, certainly the leaders of the Evo Institute uh, ha have struggled even in the 20s and 30s to try to find ways of protecting ourselves from this kind of self-recrimination, incrimination, and so forth. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. My brief answer to this is, first, I think if I were to write a critical history of the World Jewish Congress, I would be remiss in not addressing the question because so many scholars previous have examined this question and debated it. So, for example, at the second Yad Vashem conference in 1974, it was hotly debated. In 1981, uh, Randolph Brahm deba debated it with other colleagues, including Riegner, ex extensively in New York in, in 1981. And it continues to be discussed. Now, I don't necessarily think it's the sole or only question that one can ask. And I also agree with you that ultimately the Jewish organizations and the communities and individuals weren't responsible for what happened. But I don't think that that's the point of asking this question about was everything done possible for rescue operations. So I see it differently than a question of simply self-blame. Uh, there's no question that Germans and Austrians in functionary positions, military positions, the SS, the government, the uh, foreign office, etc., played a role in organizing and executing the plans. There's also no question that the allied governments, neutral countries, and third countries around the world didn't open their immigration quotas. I think the question, however, is not who's ultimately to blame for the death count, it's simply an examination of what were the politics of Jewish organizations? What methods and strategies did they try to use for rescue and relief? What were the limits of what was possible? What was actually tried? What was tried and failed? And, uh, and I think this gets into some very interesting questions about who promoted particular plans, such as the pl plans to bomb the, the train lines from Budapest to Auschwitz, for example. It also gets into the question of who's responsible for the successful rescue operations. Was it Jewish French underground, or has the World Jewish Congress, to legitimize itself after 48, taken too much credit for certain rescue operations? So I think these are still very liv uh, living, important questions that don't necessarily lead us to saying the Jews themselves were to blame. Uh, this is a question uh, about the World Jewish Congress. Uh, thanks for a very good paper. Uh, I uh, am curious about the relationship between the World Jewish Congress and the joint as an issue. Uh, I know that in the late 1930s, uh, the joint was trying to develop some kind of economic policy for the Jews of Eastern Europe. I know that uh, the uh, CKB of the joint, the microcredit arm of the joint in Poland, uh, was commissioning studies. Uh, Jacob Leszczynski was coming up with productivization plans. I know that at the same time, uh, Tartakover was coming up with articles and studies about the plight of East European Jewry. And it would seem to be uh, uh, self-evident that there would have been co collaboration uh, between the, the JDC and the World Jewish Congress. Uh, but when I was researching a talk I gave on, on Dubnov as a public intellectual, and he was very much involved with the World Jewish Congress, and there was an extensive uh, correspondence with him and Eliyahu Cherikover, which is in the Evo archives. Uh, one of the things that struck me was, was the relative absence of the economic dimension in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, deliberations of the World Jewish Congress. And so I'm wondering if, if, if you have any comments about that. I haven't researched it to any significant degree, but I'll give you my general impression based on my experience with the record so far and secondary source reading. Uh, 
I think that the World Jewish Congress internally saw itself as the poorer cousin to the JDC when it came to rescue operations because they didn't have the massive budget that the, WG, that the um, joint was able to raise. And I think this was a major issue. Um, that's the most I really know. There are certain relief operations where they collaborated, where WJC delegates were able to arrange for the actual delivery of food and medicine, but then the joint came in with the funding, which was much larger than what the WJC had. Certain JD, uh, World Jewish Congress funding was able to come from interesting quarters, like the South African Jewish community, for example. But to me, the fundamental issue was the joint simply was able to raise more money. But I don't know if I, I know more. I, I think if I went forward with this study, I would definitely address the question of their relationship. Um, just for one moment to go back to the purely archival side of things, you asked, I think, about the DPs and the, and the World Jewish Congress material. There's an inter interesting situation, Mark and I talked about it, that the uh, offices of the, the archival material of Geneva, Paris, uh, Jerusalem and London are at the Central Zionist Archives and the American material is in Cincinnati. Um, so you really should be directing your question to both the archives. I'm, I know that Mark worked from the material that we have at the, uh, that the um, US HMM uh, copied for us, so that's not the issue. But if you're asking questions about the material, it should be to both the ar archives. Well, just one question. I got the best results from, I, I got the best results from the United Nations. <laughs> they too, you know, the UNRWA, they too had not processed the papers very well, but they sent a box list and from the box list, we were able to produce at least a basic list of the major camps, the major DP camps. But I also spent two weeks in Arlson. I was talking about the 80s. I spent two weeks in Arlson in 2008. And they're not systematic, but they're extraordinary. And that's, I just was curious if the processing had progressed enough to extract that kind of information. And it's now becoming more and more available in lots of places. But thank you. Uh, I would like to come back to a question I think Joan Rudolph uh, posed, and I didn't get the answer. I didn't, don't understand. Uh, obviously, I mean, uh, these, these Romanian questionnaires have a part where the, the victims can tell their own story, a, a narrative part. And you said, or Tilegido said, they are not of any value uh, for, for him or they don't say anything. Now, I learned from, from one of our fellows and, and from all other stories that there are other questionnaires in Poland, in, in Degop, there are the ones in, in, in CDCG, and so on. And these are kind of... Um, Base, the, the basis is, is, the, is the narrative, and, and I'm kind of struck that in, this part, in these parts you say they are not of any value. Is, this a, is there any explanation for that? Uh, is it um, based in, in whatever, in, their, in the experiences of the, of the victims themselves? Or what is the difference? I mean, this is the, the basic question. Is there any difference between these questionnaires and the possibility to answer for the victims? Uh, I think that I formulated a little bit wrong. Uh, so this uh, narrative part uh, can be used, but not for hard data. It uh, can be used to uh, uh, to to see uh, individual uh, life stories, individual fates. So it can be used, but not for hard data. Are there any other comments or questions? If not, I think we can close the discussion. I want to say thank you to the two speakers. And I want to thank you all for your contributions, for your attention, and uh, for the discussion. Thank you very much. Just, just a technical announcement at the end. As you all know from uh, your conference map, we are now invited uh, by the mayor of Vienna uh, to a Heiligen, which is a small wine tavern at the outskirts of Vienna. I think this is an ideal possibility to chill out this hot day. It's a very nice uh, place where you can sit outside, nice glass of wine, and see at the beginnings of the Vienna woods.
Uh, this reception starts at 7 o'clock. You know all your routes from your hotels. The other suggestion would be uh, to stroll around in the city uh, and then to go here, pass by the other mayor of Vienna, Karl Luega. This is not the one who is inviting us, but you pass by his monument and then you take tram line two all the way to the final stop and we meet there at seven o'clock. I would be very delighted if you come there. Really, it's a nice possibility to see the outskirts of Vienna and to chill out. Thank you.